Morning, San Jose. How are you? Thank you. Right, okay. So, welcome to Real World Crypto, Crypto uh, 2019 in San Jose. I have the pleasure of uh, welcoming you here. So, uh, welcome. As you can see, it's Real World Crypto gets bigger and bigger. You know, a few years ago, at the start, there was only 80 people, and now we have shed loads of you. So big, we have to have a shed to put you in. Anyway, so um, the Wi-Fi thing is there. That's the only time you're going to see it. So, please write it down now. And now, everyone written it down? Good, good, good. Okay, so um, we're going to carry on. So, 2019, what do we have for you in 2019? Well, we are in San Jose. If you think you're meant to be somewhere else, that's because you've come for the Rugby World Cup and it's the wrong venue. So, you, whether you'll see people scrummaging on the stage or, I don't know, that's up, maybe that's what we have in the... In the, in the lightning talk section. I'd like to introduce you to the organising com committee. They're all going to stand up at one at a time. So, Dan, please stand up. He's the local organiser. <laughs> Woo! Agalas. He's, he does stuff. <laughs> Brian, where's Brian? Brian was, yep, can you stand up? Yep, well done. <laughs> Kenny. Tom, who takes over as local chair next year. <laughs> Kazu, where's Kazu? Stand up. She's new, so please welcome her. Great. Um, Tom, who sorts out all the studentship stuff. And there's me, who a lot of you have paid shed loads of money to. Thank you. We're going to thank you all later. Okay. If... We like you. This is a very social conference. So um, before we start, um, can you just uh, turn around to the person next to you if you do not know them and, and, and say hello to them? Yeah, well done. <laughs> hey, do you know? Yeah, you, these, apparently you know each other. They're not very social down here. Okay, right. So after after those quick introductions, um, we have we have a Twitter. Now, please use, if you want to contact us, please use at Real World Crypto. If there's something you want to point out to the organisers, just go at Real World Crypto and we will pick that up. Um, because there's going to be shed loads of, um, lots of shed loads of stuff, um, uh, uh, tweeting, please use hash Real World Crypto if you just want to, so we, everyone can just search for what they're doing. Do not use RWC because pff, some other organisation got that. Um, we have live streaming. We didn't think we did, but we do. Um, and the link is going to be posted to Twitter in five minutes. Okay, so there we go. So if you want to live stream whilst watching it, I don't know. If you want to go back to your hotel room or do something better, there we go. Okay. Um, we had a selection process for contributed talks. As you know, we have invited talks here. We have contributed talks. Um, we um, had 60 submissions and we accepted 22. Um, thanks to the PC and the PC chair. Yay, um, and all those people work. Um, and remember, we have a low-cost model here. So the idea with Real World Crypto is to try to keep this as cheap and cheerful as possible so we don't give you banquets, we don't give you T-shirts. If you want a T-shirt of San Jose, there are shops, okay? Right, um, um, that's it about that. So we keep it cheap. Um, it's really hard to make it cheap for a 600-plus venue conference. So that's why the the fees keep going up is, is, is simply the venue just get bigger and bigger. We couldn't hold this at Stanford. It's too many people now, okay? So that's the problem. Um, a note for speakers. Can you come up during the breaks to make sure um, you can connect your laptops? Um, we would like your slides emailed to someone. Dan. <laughs> <laughs> If you email Dan your slides, um, we will put them on the web for posterity. Um, a safety briefing, I've been told, there's apparently exit signs and they're marked in exit. Okay, so, and there's escalators in the hallway near registrations and behind you. Okay. Dumpty dum. Okay, as of 3 a.m. in the morning, I had jet lag. Um, we had 626 registrations. We probably have more now. Um, 502 were regular, and uh, 124 were the cheapies. They're the students. Um, uh, 330 are new members of the IACR. Since last year, Real World Crypto is part of the IACR stable of conferences, and so 
by coming here, you automatically become a member for 2020. So this is 2019. You become a member for the next year. So in the 2020 elections, you can vote for suitably real people at the, uh, at the ICR elections as opposed to imaginary people or ideal people or whatever. Okay, there's um, uh, the largest number of people were from the USA, uh, 52 from um, something called the UK, and then um, there's some other countries. Um, not very many from Belgium this year, which is a pity. Okay, we have a record number of sponsors, um, which allows us to give out a large number of stipends. So we're supporting how many did I work out? 60 stipends, of which 20 are funded by um, NSF money. So we want to thank the NSF, and we also want to thank. A marvellous list of sponsors, which no longer fit on one slide. So we have Algorand. Thank you, Algorand. Thank you, Amazon. Give them all a round of applause. Blockstream, Baffle, Cisco, Cloudflare, Crypto Expert, Crypto Mapit, Duality, Envale, Facebook, Galwa, Google, Infer, Isara, IOHK, MongolDB, Mozilla, NCC Group, New Cipher, NXP, QEDT, Rambo, <laughs> Zebio, Settle, ShareMind, Symbolic Software, Thundercore, Unbound, Visa Research, and Zcash. As I said, shed loads, lots of you give me shed loads of money. Okay. If you want to know what's coming up, we have 2020 is in Colombia, not the country, but the um, university. Have I spelled that right? I can't remember. Um, in 2021, we're going to be in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And 2022, we are looking for venues. So if you would like to... Um, um, yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I just, yeah, I just, it was three, th it's three o'clock in the morning, what do you expect? Anyway, so, um, I've only one spelling mistake on the slides, that's pretty good for me. Okay, um, so if you want to host 2022 or later, please come and talk to us. It's really easy to host one of the Real World Crypto Conference venues. As you can see, this is not a very big thing to organise, and yeah, and there's lots of sponsors, so this, it's quite easy. And... Let the show begin, and I'm going to pass on to our session chair, who's going to be Dan. All right. <clears throat> All right, thanks, Nigel. This is uh, fantastic. It's always fun to host this conference. I'm really glad to see so many of you here. Uh, two more things I wanted just to add. First is uh, tomorrow, uh, just before lunch, we're going to have our usual lightning session talk. So this is where everybody gets to come up to the mic, well, not everybody, anyone who wants to, gets to come up to the mic and speak for two, three, four, five minutes, possibly. Uh, so think if you want to have, if you have anything interesting to say, if you'd like to propose a new problem, if you want to just say what you're working on, just come up to the mic and uh, you'll, be, you'll have time to present. Uh, so that'll take place tomorrow just before lunch. And I guess uh, I do have to say that we're in downtown San Jose. There, If you have some free time, there are a bunch of museums around here. So go explore downtown. It's kind of a nice place to visit. So uh, enjoy. Um, good. All right. So uh, with that, let's get started. So our first uh, session is on message security and our first messaging security. And our first talk is about this new exciting effort on message layer security. And Richard Barnes is going to give the talk. So Richard, all yours. All right, here we go. Thanks for the intro, Dan. Thanks to all of you for waking up on this first morning of the conference from whatever time zone you've arrived from. I want to open up and say right off the bat that there's a list of folks on the front page of this slide that are the guys who put this together, who put together the presentation. But the community of folks working on this project is really much, much larger. Like any IETF effort, this is an open development project. It's totally open. And all of these uh, folks, uh, folks represented on this slide, have already contributed to date. Uh, have made some con concrete contribution to the protocol. And notice the thing at the bottom where it says your name here. Part of the reason we're, at, we're making this presentation is to get more community awareness around this and get more involvement so we can make the protocol better. So let me dive into what we're doing here. The high-level context for this work is decoherence in the securing messaging space. So I'm willing to bet that pretty much everyone in this room has at least one of these apps on your phone. Uh, or, or your laptop or some device that you carry around with you that lets you communicate securely with other people being protected from the from network that's, that's transmitting uh, the, the messages. 
a lot of these, uh, you know, each one of these needs some protocol to do the, the crypto to protect its, its messages. And so they're all doing pretty much similar things. Some of them do them in similar ways. Some of them do them in super different ways. Um, there's, there's kind of various tribes around these. Um, but they're all kind of solving the same problem. So we have this fragmentation situation, which results in a, a situation where there's wildly different levels of analyses on these different protocols. Some of them are very thoroughly vetted. Um, a lot of the double ratchet-based variants have, have had a lot of research put into them. But others are completely unvetted. It's, we're just going on what the vendor says. There's a lot of wasted effort here, because even in cases where the protocols are similar, people are using forks to do slightly different things uh, and, and having to do maintenance on their own libraries. So there's a lot of wasted effort here. So the overall goal here is to share more. Um, and the way we kind of know how to share in this industry is by specifying things and doing interop so that people can uh, develop independently uh, and, and share the, the code that they build. So the overall deliverable for this working group, that we're this work that we're doing, is a set of detailed specifications for, uh, for I've got three critical properties here. We have an async group messaging security protocol. When we say async, the critical property there is that we need to be able to have a session, a, a secure messaging session where we're protected where no two participants are online at the same time. So I can fire up my device and start a conversation with Catriel while his phone is powered off, and then he can power up and sync up his state and receive messages without anyone else being able to see that stuff. We need to support groups. Um, lots of messaging today, um, if you look at the stats, the telemetry these apps get, a lot of messaging is done in groups, and a lot of the pain we feel with current protocols is um, with those group settings. Uh, so these groups, need, we need to support groups. We need to support large groups, because you see groups of thousands, even up to tens of thousands of, of, of participants um, in a lot of these settings. So we need to support large groups, and we need to support groups where people come and go, because if you have 1,000 people in your, in your organization, you're going to have people coming and going over time. And finally, we need to do all this stuff with modern security uh, um, protocols I've, I've put on the slide, I mean properties. Um, things like forward security and post-compromise security I'll talk about more in a minute. So the overall goal of all this, like I said, is to get sharing, to have code that we can reuse in multiple contexts, and when we need to write different code for different contexts, to make sure that that code can interoperate. So if I write one stack for my iOS app and one stack for my web app, I know that they can work together, and I don't have to do a lot of intense coordination to make, make sure that they work together. Having a shared uh, implementation target also gives us a shared analysis target. So largely we're following the pattern we did with TLS 1.3 here. So with TLS 1.3 we had this, this coordination between the spec writing, the implementation, and the academic uh, security analysis and verification. So we're trying to get that same dynamic here where we have a single common target for analysis and verification so that we can build a lot of confidence and, and have much more wider deployment of, of these protocols. So very top level goals. Now, what's the context in which we're building this? So it's pretty much you'd expect. So you have a bunch of devices, your client, you imagine like a phone or a laptop or something. Each user has one or more devices and users come together in a group where they want to message securely. And they're interacting via some what we call a delivery service. And when you think about that, you think of like the servers up in the cloud, they're gonna take a message that someone sends and route it to all the other people in the group. And the overall goal of this protocol is pretty much what you'd expect. It's protect you from that delivery service. So you want to make sure the delivery service can't read your messages, can't tamper with your messages, and you want to make sure that you can authenticate who have sent a message and authenticate that they're a member of the group. So typical you know, trio of things, with, and also some of those modern properties I'll get to in a second. I want to highlight two kind of differences from what you might expect in terms of deployed reality with this. One is that the delivery service we represent here is kind of an abstract thing. Now, usually in deployed reality today, that's a single service uh, uh, operated by a single provider who also, sells you, also gives you the app. Um, but you could also imagine running this over something like a DHT or over Vuvuzela, something that would give you more protection. So the delivery service is kind of this abstract function. You can imagine delivering different ways. We've also split out the authentication service uh, from the delivery service, which is different from a lot of things today. It's a lot of things today. The app tells you which keys belong to whom, and you trust that the app to, to provide you that binding. Um, but with things like key transparency and uh, external authentication services, we're seeing already authentication to split off from the delivery function itself. Um, so we wanted to accommodate that in our architecture. 
another way to look at this is kind of in terms of layering, kind of the, the slice of the stack we're trying to get to. And I've made an analogy to TLS here. When you look at how TLS works in the real world, it gets transported over a bunch of different protocols and it gets used to carry a bunch of different protocols and gets embedded into different applications in different ways. And that's sort of what we're envisioning here. We're not trying to make it so that WhatsApp can communicate with wire. Um, we're not trying to solve the whole stack problem like that. We're trying to make a crypto protocol that each of those can integrate into its app over its own transport, carrying messages in its format, but getting a common set of security guarantees. And that kind of affects the set of security issues we're trying to attack here. So, for example, there's issues at the application layer. In the HTTP case, you have things like HTXSS and phishing. You have issues at the transport layer like traffic analysis. Those are not really what we're targeting here. We're really targeting protection against this delivery service, uh, getting those properties I mentioned a moment ago. Now, we made an analogy to TLS. Let's look at what's different from TLS. What makes MLS different from TLS is a couple of things. One is, as I've already highlighted, we're looking at groups. TLS is explicitly a point to point protocol. You have a client, you have a server, you have two actors. In MLS, you've got lots of them. Um, like I said, we have rooms in Cisco Spark that I work on that have uh, 1,500 people pretty regularly. It's pretty common. Um, so you've got lots more points of compromise in a given uh, a session. Moreover, when you have a session, messaging session, you know, TLS session might last, last a few seconds, maybe hours if you're really, really lucky. Messaging sessions, like, you know, if you had a messaging session with your mom, like, how long is that going to last? It's like months, years, forever, right? And all of that is compromise window, right? So you've got a big compromise surface here. You've got lots of people. You've got lots of time. And the upshot is, especially when you have the fact that a lot of these devices are mobile, you have a high degree of certainty that sometime in all that space of this, of this messaging session, someone's going to get compromised, and something's going to leak, and something's going to go bad. And what that means is that we need to be robust with regard to those things. And so here's where we really get to the importance of those forward security and post-compromise security properties. So these are, are, are terms that are probably pretty familiar to people by now, especially forward security. But it, they kind of acquire extra significance in this messaging context because you have that large uh, compromise surface over the session. So the point of both of these is to, to effectively limit blast radius. So if someone's compromised at a point in time, forward security says you know, they don't get things that happened before the compromise uh, happened. And post-compromise security says that we can take some action once the compromise is over and we know we're in a better state, we can take some action to restore that session to a good state and lock the person out. So we, we, we have these kind of ceremonies. I've done it by the, the dotted lines here actions we can take in the protocol that lock someone out of the history and lock someone out of future messages. And that um, is kind of what we're trying to achieve through a lot of the crypto here. So I want to recognize um, some of the prior art here in, in light of these properties, um, in light of some of the scaling things we're after. Basically, um, the, the things that are closest to what we're doing here, these client fan out and sender keys, which are both widely deployed in those apps I, I pointed out earlier. And the, 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 what we see here is we've had a challenge uh, in prior work in terms of achieving these good uh, security properties in terms of forward secrecy and post-compromise security while also being able to scale well to groups. And so that's, that's really kind of the one-line summary of what we're after with MLS is to get these modern properties for groups but with good scaling. And I, I try, kind of tried to draw this in a picture in terms of to compare uh, how things um, uh, prior art to what we're working on here. And this is admittedly super hand wavy. There's no, no uh, you know, there's fades in the graph. There's no units on the axes. But the idea is that, um, you know, the top of each bar where it fades out is kind of the worst case and the common case is where, it, where it's solid. Um, but you can see here with, with client fan out, which is the thing to have in mind there is things like SMIME and PGP, which get reflected in some more modern stuff as well. With that, it's, it's all linear all the time. You just encrypt to everybody in parallel. It's, it's very simple, it's very easy to think about, but you have very straightforward, very bad, per well, you know, not great performance. The slightly more modern stuff uh, with sender keys does, trades a little bit. It trades some bad performance in some rare cases. So you're gonna create a group once and you're gonna add more than you remove, probably. So it trades off some bad performance in those cases in exchange for constant time messaging. And so what I'll talk about in terms of the protocol we did with, for, we're doing for MLS is to try and bring those uh, sometimes quadratic things down to worst case linear and to bring some of the things that are linear down to log or constant time. So that, that's kind of the state as of the current draft of the protocol. Obviously, we're hoping to do better um, if, if we can. 
So I wanted to briefly review the history of this because it, it touches actually on, on real world crypto. Uh, we have kind of a pulse here around real world crypto. So the, the deep history goes back to 2015 when John Milliken from Facebook and I were first introduced. And what was interesting was we didn't know it at the time. But we were both working on this problem in parallel from separate threads. And in 2017, uh, John, working with some folks at Oxford, published this, this e-print um, on ends-to-ends -ends encryption, which got assigned the number 666, and the register put that, uh, that graphic with it when they printed it. But what that caused, we had this kind of like crossing the stream, sparks start to fly. It's kind of neat to kind of memorialize that moment. So I pinged John on Facebook and said, hey, um, maybe we should do something about this messaging thing. Um, and so th at that point, things started to come together. Ecker and I had been working on finding people who were interested in working on this, and, and, and John had kind of some connections in the academic community. And so we started to come together. We had some workshops among these folks to uh, discuss what problem we were going to try and address and how we might try and address it. And then uh, by the time we got to about uh, mid-2018, we had enough that we thought we could uh, pitch a working group to the MLS and got uh, uh, to the ITF and got a working group established. And so now, uh, we're kind of up to today. We've had a few meetings. We're actually making progress. We're on, uh, the, I think, the fourth or fifth draft of the protocol. And it actually has some compelling secu uh, security properties, I think. Uh, we'll get some verification later. But it has some, some good-looking performance properties, at least. Um, so let's dive into the protocol. So this is kind of the, the play school, high-level conceptual model to have in mind for how the protocol is going to work. So let's start on the top left. We have this tree that encapsulates the state of a group in a given time. We'll talk about what is in the tree in a minute. But kind of think, how do you go from linear to log? You, you arrange things in a tree. That's you know, computer science 101. So we're going to represent the state at a given time by a tree. And that tree, we're going to derive from that tree what we'll call an epoch secret, which is going to be a secret that is shared by the group at a given time. And that's what we're going to do, how we're going to get this, the application secrets that we'll use for things like message encryption or authentication, the actual stuff we want to do with this. Most of the work we're going to do here is just focused on the key exchange. And we'll punt the, uh, the actual work of um, getting the security and applying the keys to, to, some, to other stuff. Um, so we've got this tree and the epoch secret and the application secret that, that are in operation at a given time. But like we said, we want to support dynamic groups. And so periodically, you want to make a change. Uh, and so when you're joined and you have that epoch secret, you're part of the group, you can generate protocol messages that will then update the tree and change the tree, change the state of the group, add someone, remove someone, et cetera, that will then get reflected in the epoch secrets and update you know, the secrets the group holds. So that's, that's kind of the overall big picture flow here. I'd like to take a moment, moment of zen, like get, get friendly with trees, like think about how lovely trees can be because there's going to be a lot on the next few slides, so just get, get prepared. So like I said, how you turn something from linear to log, you make it into a tree. So the, the core kind of real crypto we've got going on here is we arrange a key, a, a, a tree of key pairs. And we arrange it so that we have this invariance, I call the tree invariance. Um, which is that the private key for a given intermediate node in the tree is, is known... Oh, is, hello. It, the private key for an intermediate node is known to a leaf node if and only if that leaf node is, in, is a descendant of the intermediate node. So I should say as well, we're putting our members of the group... Uh, I'm getting some feedback here. Can we drop that back a little bit, AV folks? Oh, we had to complain. It wasn't high enough. Oh, well. <laughs> Just right. So let me, let me drop back a little bit. So we've got the members of the group at the leaves here. Um, and then the intermediate nodes kind of represent collectivities, subgroups of the, of the overall group. And we do that by having this tree invariant. Uh, so that uh, the private key, say, for J in this diagram is known to A, B, C, and D, but not E and F. And this is kind of a neat property. It enables us to basically use these key pairs that are at intermediate points in the tree to represent these subgroups. And then you can use those key pairs to do Diffie-Hellman or to do things like ECIES to do encryption that is accessible only to that subgroup. Another property is that the root of that, because it's the root, which is an ancestor of everything, is known to the whole group. And so you can use that as a shared secret that everyone in, is, uh, in the group knows at a given point in time. And so the whole point of the protocol, like I said, the protocol messages update this tree. And so the protocol maintains this tree as an accurate representation of the group while maintaining that tree invariant. So the first step we took at this was due, due to Kramer, uh, Catriel, Kramer is it all um, from, from Oxford, um, what's called asynchronous ratchet trees or ART. 
Um, and the way, way that uh, construct works is you, take the, you generate the intermediate nodes from their children. So in this case, you, you uh, take A and B and you do a Diffie-Hellman exchange between them to generate the private key for that parent node E. And so you can see if uh, A, say, knows the public keys for uh, B and F, it can do the Diffie-Hellman exchanges to generate the private keys up to the root. This, this, uh, when you write it down, it's, it's very easy to see how this leads to a log depth update. If you want to change a leaf key, you can send uh, a log number of things to uh, update the, the nodes along the path to the root. And so uh, that, that was what it was uh, discussed in this original paper um, and, and kind of the inspiration for, for this whole thing. Unfortunately, when we sat down to try and figure out how to do adds and removes and kind of make the tree dynamic in that way, we discovered that we couldn't do it without what we call a double join property. Um, basically, no matter how you arrange it, you end up violating this tree invariant. So you end up with some, a member of the group holding a private key for the, a tree node that it shouldn't have. Um, and it comes down to, you know, you can't add someone and, and populate the nodes above them without also finding out those nodes. You can't kind of obliviously do it. At least we haven't figured out to anyway, so suggestions welcome. But we then took a second step at this, kind of swapping out DH for tree chem and no longer generating an intermediate node from both of its children, but setting the value of an intermediate node when one of those children updates. So if, when we update a leaf, we're updating, uh, updating D here. What we do is we generate the, private, the secrets for the uh, parent nodes by just hashing up the tree. So each uh, the secret value for each parent is the hash of the child that's updating. So it's not, it has nothing to do with the other child, it's just set by the latest updated child. But what we can do then to, to make uh, the, the rest of the tree aware of this, since they can't compute it via, via something like DH, is we take that new secret that's been hashed and we encrypt it to the other folks who are supposed to have it. So, you know, uh, node C here is supposed to have um, the secret for node F because it's a child. And so when D does this update, it takes that secret F and encrypts it to node C. Um, what's nice is, so if you do this up repeatedly up the tree, you end up with, with an overall operation that does two things. It encrypts some new entropy to everybody in the tree except the old version of the leaf that's updating. So if D was some value X before, X is no longer part of the tree, D is. So you've... Um, encrypted some new entropy to everyone except the old value. And you've also updated those people's view of the tree so that it reflects the new value and they can do operations with it now as well. So it, it's kind of a nice combination fact, uh, which gives us exactly what we, it turns out to give us exactly what we need for updates and removes, um, et cetera. So another nice property of this, which gets us out of this double join problem, is that because you're doing encryption instead of DH and you're not uh, incorporating both children into the parent's value, you can have one of the children, one or both really, be blank. And you accommodate that by just falling through. So if, in this case, uh, D was supposed to encrypt H, uh, the root node, to uh, the node that's blank here, but it's not there. And so instead, it can encrypt to the leaf nodes, A and B, that we're supposed to know. And so what this lets you do is say, you know, in a, if I arrive in a scenario where I would have to double join, where I would instantiate a node where someone knows the secret who's not supposed to, I just don't set it. I just set it to a blank. And so you can do an add just by shoving a node on, shoving a leaf onto the end of the tree and leaving everything else blank. Um, and it, you lose some efficiency that way. We'll talk about trade-offs in a moment. But the protocol works and I think we get the properties we want. There are some other benefits here in terms of performance and maybe some, some better post-quantum properties. But tree cam is, is kind of the, the mode we're working in right now. So just to give a, I don't have space, uh, don't have time to go into details, but this, this kind of gives you the flavor of how you do updates to this. So when you want to add someone, basically you, you slam uh, the, their uh, pre-published public key onto the end of the tree, it's a new leaf. Don't worry about the, the parents because you, you, you can't set them, so just set them to blanks. Um, so you add that on and you send the new guy this, a, a secret that can be used to compute the next state of the group. And so I, I hinted before that this gives us a constant time add. You can see there's no real tree interactions. You're just doing a constant time add a leaf and one encryption to send the new guy the stuff. So that's, it's kind of a cool efficiency thing at the cost of some, some lower efficiency later. Like I said uh, a moment ago, uh, this double action of sending some new entropy to everyone but the updater uh, kind of gives us exactly what we need for updates. So when you, that lets you update the contribution of that leaf, 
which gives you post-compromise security. Oh, hand wave, hand wave. Uh, but that's, that is our approach to getting post-compromise security uh, with regard to that participant. So that's, that's sufficient for update. And then the only extra thing you need to do remove is you take the person you want to remove, you send some extra, some new entropy to everyone but that node, and then you blank out that node's path to the root, and he's now gone from the group state. So high-level, hand-wavy overview of, of the protocol because this is a limited time slot. Now, remember, we, we, in the big diagram, we took the tree, we have made epoch secrets out of it that uh, became the application secrets. And this is, um, we, what we want to kind of do is do that in a way that we have a consistent history of the group. So the tree represents the state of the group at a point in time. And so we take those roots of the tree, which are, common, which are known to everybody in the group, we use those as what we call update secrets to feed into a chain, a KDF chain, that represents the history of the group. So at each moment in time where the group has a consistent state, we call that an epoch. The tree contributes to the history and gives us an epoch secret, which is also known to everyone in the group. And again, which we use to generate the stuff that we're gonna do real work with. And then we use that to, to evolve, uh, you know, as we evolve forward, we update the tree and we feed that in with the prior history of the group to get the new state of the group uh, for, for what we're gonna do the real work with. So that's, that's kind of the overall shape. Um, and that's, that's kind of the unauthenticated key exchange uh, part of it. So as a lot of protocols do, we start with an unauthenticated key exchange and we add authentication around it. This is a pretty serious hard hat area. It's brand, maybe like a couple months old in terms of how long we've been looking at it. it hasn't gotten looked at real hard. But the basic idea is we do kind of a sign plus Mac thing, kind of like Sigma, kind of like TLS where we, when you send a message that's gonna update the group state, uh, the sender signs that message to prove it's from him. And then we have a Mac that folds in the new group state to demonstrate that everyone, to confirm that everyone's end up, ended up at the same group state. Um, my, lots of similarities here to, to TLS and Sigma, um, as, as I'll mention when I get to the verification portion later. So that's kind of the outline of the protocol. How are you doing on time? I think we're pretty good. Excellent, exactly where I wanted to be. So is it actually secure? So like I said before, we're trying to do this thing like we did with TLS, where we have spec, implementation, and verification all going and informing each other as we go through this. And we're still working on the verification part. Um, so we're trying to follow a lot of precedents where we do have a lot of results. So TLS, there's been a lot of good research verifying its security properties. Art, the first version of the tree stuff, had uh, some, some work in the, in the paper there. But we're still working on kind of adapting this, those findings to TreeCam, to whatever authentication we end up coming up with from that drafty stuff I just presented. And then of course we need to fit the whole system together. Now there's, there's some kind of scientific challenges here when you look at the tools that are out there for doing formal verification. We've got these forward secrecy and post-compromise security that you're trying to get with regard to endpoints, with regard to uh, things over time. And we've got dynamic groups of arbitrary size. So whatever verification tools you're doing, like better be really good at induction because they need to, to be able to verify properties that could apply to two people, could apply to 2,000 people, could apply to 20 million people. So there, there's some challenges here for the community that's kind of getting toward uh, future directions, things where we could really use some help. So where are we going? I've, I've hinted a couple times that we've, we've taken some trade-offs here as we've uh, tried to come up with a protocol. One major step we took was to have shared group state. So if you look at something like client fan out, where you're just parallel encrypting to each uh, different recipient. There's no common state to the group. And as a result, you get linear performance everywhere. So we have this shared group state, which is this tree that everyone has a slice of. And we evolve that as everybody evolves that state in time in parallel. But what that means is, you know, we, we get lots of good performance out of that. All these green things on the left-hand side, we get log size uh, things for some things. We get constant time stuff in other cases. But what it means is we have some really challenging things for deployment, like um, the uh, key exchange messages need to ha be received by all recipients in the same order, which might not seem challenging, but in the real world where you've got you know, a diverse set of participants all receiving messages asynchronously, it can be challenging to assure. An interesting cryptographic problem we have is that we have this complicated tree state, which we're doing updates to over as the group changes. And it, it's totally possible to construct updates, things that look valid, to the, uh, look like valid updates to the tree, which are valid kind of from one point up and lock out everyone on this side. So a malicious insider can totally uh, screw up the state of the group um, in ways that are really hard to recover from. So I think there's some opportunities for, for you know, applying zero knowledge proofs or something like that to enable the group to verify that what looks like a valid update actually is. 
Similarly, we've, we've um, taken this pre-chem approach with blank nodes to avoid the double join problem and to get this constant time add thing, which is, is pretty slick. But the cost there is um, that the clients have to maintain the whole tree. They, don't have, they can't maintain just a slice of it. They really have to maintain a whole view. And um, if you create with just the leaves, you end up what we, with what we've been calling warm-up time. So things, basically the, the first few things you do with your group are linear time and gradually they converge down to log or constant time. Um, and so, you know, we've got, if you think back to that bar chart I had where there were the fades, like log in the constant common case and linear in the worst case, that's the kind of things we're trying to, to figure out how to address. Can, can we really force it down to the log case in all cases? So really that, that whole right-hand column is like help wanted. Um, you know, those, those are some good, good research problems to chew on. We'd be glad to have contributions there to kind of get the benefits we want on the left-hand side while not having to accept you know, the drawbacks on the right-hand side. So kind of getting to the end here, um, where we are in terms of kind of concrete stuff, we've got a bunch of documents in progress in the IETF that describe the architecture for how we're doing this and the specification for the protocol for you know, concretely how you do the, the crypto math and how you arrange things, how you uh, format the messages, et cetera. Those are still like, we're on the, like I said, the fourth or fifth draft. Um, which means we've, we've got kind of a pretty good baseline. We have, kind of have our feet under us, but there's a lot of to-dos here. Um, there's all those red boxes on the previous slide and a bunch of features that we haven't figured out how to add yet as well. So if you're specification inclined, you know, like to build protocols, like there's um, lots of contributions to be made here. We'd be glad to have them. Likewise, if you're code inclined, we have a few stacks that people have started on uh, in a variety of languages, ranging from uh, you know, ancient stuff like C++ uh, to modern stuff like Rust and F-Star. I'm not sure where to put JavaScript in that taxonomy. Um, but we've got a variety of stacks out there that, that are, are starting to mature. We're starting to do interop testing. Um, so if you wanted to contribute to those or start up new ones or you know, even help us figure out how to do interop testing or you know, put it into practice in some case, we'd be glad to have uh, contributions there so that we can help learn from that as we develop the protocol and uh, do the verifications better. So that's what I have. Um, here's the links to documents. Uh, Catcher will register our, our dot rocks domains, um, so you can easily get to the protocol and the architecture that way. Um, but um, glad to have questions, comments, awesome. uh, Thank contributions. You. Thank you. We have we have time for questions. So there are mics along the uh, corridors there. So please line up. Don't think the mic's on. Can we turn the side mic on? Go ahead. All right. Yeah, I'm not sure the linear size state on the clients is actually a problem because you have a, um, there's another, I mean, a lot of what you're trying to prevent with forward security is these ghost user problems. Like somebody gets a phone and adds somebody and this is something that nobody's, nobody really has a good solution to, but if we do have a good, we need a good solution to it. And at that point, um, the, so at that point, you're going to probably need this linear state anyway, or maybe not. I don't know. But the, the real question I wanted to ask is, so in de um, the asynchronous ratcheting trees paper made me a little bit nervous about these ghost users because people could just have their own subtrees. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, um, in, in, in this uh, design, we'll, we'll, so I, it sounds like the entire tree will actually be verifiable to the par participants, which should eliminate... So, which should be make solving the ghost user problem at least possible. Yeah, so, so one aspect of the state I didn't really talk about is that the, the clients also maintain an idea of uh, who is you know, the identities of the parties who are at those leaves. Um, and the idea is that there's some sort of authentication at that leaf point. So you have authentication of the leaves. Um, and we've got, that's, that's kind of the layer at which the authentication attaches. So. You still can't prevent someone from you know, sharing the secret that goes with that and managing that however they want. They can create a subtree, but at least you have that authentication boundary. So if they do that, you know who's doing it. And yeah. you the, the point would more that. be at some point whenever we figure out a nice way to start excluding people's devices because we haven't seen anything from them recently or whatever. Yeah, I think that that was one of the things that came up when we had the workshops with the with the developers. I'd love if you'd love to hear it if you have any thoughts on that. Other questions? Can you, can you say that like? Uh, is there buy-in from the existing messaging app, Signal, you know, WhatsApp, iMessage? Are they going to use what comes out of this effort? I mean, forward-looking statements are hard. <laughs> 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 uh, 
but what we've tried to do is, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, the, 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 for, the future the predictions are hard, especially about the future. Um, what we've tried to do is get those vendors involved from the early stages and um, understand their requirements and try and have, create a product here, a protocol that can be deployed more or less as is in the systems that exist today. So these workshops that we had um, in the timeline I had involved um, uh, me from Cisco, Ecker from Mozilla, uh, Google, the, the Google Allo team, the Facebook Messenger team, uh, Wire has been very actively contributing. So we've got a, a, at least a, a set of these, um, these vendors who are, who are there. And you know, hopefully that will um, help this, the protocol we come up with be something that's viable and could be adopted easily by other folks. Awesome, fantastic work, thank you. Thank you. All right, so we're going to continue on with uh, messaging security, and we're going to move on to uh, like issues with uh, message franking. And Joanna Woodage is going to give the next talk. All yours, Joanna. Do you want me to remove this? Um, oh, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You need, uh, Richard, you, moved, you walked away with a shirt mic. <laughs> we need your mic. Yes. Oh, um, uh, well, we have, you have HDMI, so we just go like this. Yes, speakers, let's not walk off with the mic. <laughs> all right, all yours, Joanna. OK, great. Thank you very much. OK, so today I'm going to be talking about the problem of verifiable abuse reporting in encrypted messaging applications. And I'm going to give an overview of some recent work that I've done with my co-authors, Yevgeny Dodis, Paul Grubbs, and Tom Ristenpart on building fast and secure solutions to this problem. OK. So the idea of an end-to-end -end encrypted messaging application is that all the messages exchanged can be read only by the sender and the receiver. And so this is achieved by having all such messages encrypted under a key shared only by these parties. Now the effect of this is that nobody else, including a service provider, can learn anything about the content of these messages. Now, encrypted messaging applications are becoming increasingly widespread with WhatsApp, Facebook, and Signal, among many others, now offering these services. And so it's fair to say that billions of users now rely on these for security. Now, this is certainly great news in terms of privacy, especially in light of fears post-Snowden that service providers may collude with law enforcement agencies to hand over their users' data. However, one thing that encrypted messaging does complicate um, is verifiable abuse reporting. So it's well known that people use messaging applications to send abusive content. And service providers want to help users by enabling them to report this abuse so appropriate sanctions can be taken. Now, in an encrypted messaging application, a receiver certainly can report an abusive message that they've been sent. However, since everything's encrypted, the service provider has no way of verifying if the claimed message was the one that was actually sent. Now, at the same time, um, you can equally imagine someone sending a perfectly innocuous message to a malicious receiver, who then tries to pretend that this message was something abusive in order to get the sender into trouble. And again, since everything's encrypted, the service provider has no way of establishing who is telling the truth. So to navigate this tension, in 2016, Facebook introduced a technique called message franking into their secret conversations, where well, the name here comes from speaking frankly. Now, the idea of message franking is to provide a cryptographic proof of the contents of a message, which can later be verified by the service provider in order to facilitate abuse reporting. 
And Facebook's technique was actually the, uh, the subject of a talk by John Milliken right here at RWC back in 2017. Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to begin by talking about what message franking is, and then going to talk about Facebook's approach to message franking, and this is where we're going to meet the invisible salamanders, which are hinted at in the title. And finally, I'm going to give an overview of our solution for fast and secure message franking. Okay, so what is message franking? So, Inspired by what Facebook were doing, in 2017, Grubbs, Liu, and Ristenpart formalized the notion of a message franking scheme as a primitive in its own right. So I'm going to begin by recalling their definition here. So essentially, a message franking scheme is an encryption scheme with an added verification algorithm. Now, the ciphertext produced by these schemes are going to consist of two components, C1 and C2. And we want this to be such that, taken together, C1 and C2 constitute an encryption of the message M. However, taken by itself, this component C2, which we're going to call the binding tag, constitutes a commitment to that message M. So more formally, a commitment um, commits to a message in such a way that if a user knows a special verification key, they can check whether some claimed message really does underlie that commitment. But if they don't know the key, then the commitment reveals nothing about the message contents. OK, so back to message franking. How this is going to work is that when we decrypt C1 and C2, this is going to uncover both the underlying message and also this special verification key. And then this verification key can then be used with this added verification algorithm to check whether some message M prime really underlies that binding tag C2. OK, so in terms of message franking security, we have three key properties. So the first is that we want to make sure that encryption with our scheme satisfies the usual confidentiality and integrity guarantees that we'd expect from any good authenticated encryption scheme, with some adaptation here to the message franking setting. So more precisely, we want to make sure that these properties hold, even if an attacker can learn the verification keys corresponding to some of these ciphertexts. Secondly, um, we want the binding tag and the verification algorithm to be such that if a ciphertext decrypts correctly, then there's no way that a sender can later deny its contents. And at the same time, we want it to be that a receiver can never pretend that any other message underlies a given binding tag than the one that which was actually sent. And hopefully you can see how these two latter properties prevent these abuse reporting at attacks that I mentioned at the start of the talk. Finally, we um, have an additional compactness requirement, which is for efficiency reasons, we want this binding tag C2 to be short. OK, so this is what message franking is. And you'll recall that the whole reason we're interested in this in the first place is in a response to a technique already being deployed by Facebook. So we're now going to take a look at Facebook's approach to message franking. OK, so first, Facebook employ a message franking scheme which works as follows. So to encrypt a message, the sender first chooses a random verification key, KF. And they use this key to compute an HMAC-based commitment to the message M. And this commitment is going to form the binding tag for um, our franking scheme, C2. So the sender then encrypts both the message and the verification key together using an encrypt the MAC authenticated encryption scheme and sends both these components over to Facebook. Facebook then compute their own MAC tag over the binding tag C2 and all this then gets sent to the receiver. So to decrypt, the receiver simply decrypts these components C1 and C2 together to recover both the underlying message and the verification key and they then use this key to verify the HMAC-based commitment, and they'll return an error if either of these steps fail. OK, so to see how abuse reporting works, if a receiver receives an abusive message, um, they can report this to Facebook as follows. So basically, they send Facebook the message along with the associated binding tag, verification key, and Facebook tag. Facebook can then verify this binding tag commitment themselves. This is this added verification step we were talking about. And if this checks out, then it proves to Facebook that that abusive message really does underlie that binding tag. 
Facebook then verify their own tag, which proves to them that the binding tag was the one that was really sent. And then if all this checks out, Facebook are convinced that the receiver really did receive that abusive message, and they can act accordingly. So in terms of security, um, Grubbs et al. prove that this does indeed give a secure message ranking scheme with respect to their definition, which is certainly great news. However, what's not so good is that this scheme is really quite slow compared to regular authenticated encryption. So in particular, it requires three cryptographic passes over the data to compute. Um, that's one to compute the HMAC-based commitment, and then two more to compute the encrypt and then MAC AAD scheme. And when you think that um, the fastest authenticated encryption schemes um, compute the full encryption with just a single pass, this is quite a slowdown. So because of this lack of efficiency, it turns out that Facebook handle message ranking for attachment files, which are typically going to be quite large, a bit differently. Okay, so because this is a fairly short talk, I'm omitting quite a lot of details, but the kind of key idea is that Rather than encrypting the attachment file directly with this secure but slow message ranking scheme that we've just seen, instead, the sender chooses a one-time file encryption key, k-file, and they're going to use this to encrypt the file using just a regular authenticated encryption scheme, ASGCM, which in particular is very fast. So the sender then takes this one-time file encryption key, and it is this key that they are then going to commit and encrypt to using the secure franking scheme that we just saw. And of course, because this file encryption key is likely to be um, much smaller than the file, this is going to be much less effort to frank. Okay, so to decrypt, the receiver simply decrypts C1 and C2 to Keralad to recover the one-time file encryption key, and they can then use this to decrypt the attachment ciphertext. So, um, at first glance, this looks like a pretty reasonable approach. However, it turns out that a subtle flaw allows an attacker to send an abusive attachment such that all attempts by the receiver to report this to Facebook are going to fail. Now, there are two key properties of the scheme which enable the attack. So the first such property is that it turns out that GCM, which you'll recall is what is being used to actually encrypt the file, is not a secure message ranking scheme. In fact, more than that, um, GCM has this property where it's really quite easy to construct a ciphertext which decrypts to different valid messages under different keys. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the term, um, this basically means that GCM is not robust. Now, the second property is that when a user reports an abusive attachment to Facebook, Facebook takes all attachment ciphertexts, which the user has recently received, and performs its verification procedure on these. Now, during this process, if Facebook see the same attachment cipher, the same GCM ciphertext more than once, they assume that it's a duplicate, and they don't add anything about this to the abuse report. So, taken by itself, this kind of deduplication behavior um, doesn't really cause a problem. However, as we're going to see, this deduplication behavior, combined with the lack of robustness of um, GCM, is what allows our attack. Okay, so the attack works as follows. The first step of the attack, um, in, during the first step, the attacker constructs a special GCM ciphertext C star, um, such that the ciphertext decrypts to a perfectly innocuous attachment under one key and to an abusive attachment under the other key. And we know that this is easy to do by this first property that we've just discussed. Now, in the second stage of the attack, the attack is going to send this special ciphertext C star to the victim twice, the first time accompanied by the innocuous key and the second time accompanied by the abusive key. So the receiver decrypts both of these, recovering first the harmless attachment and the second time the abusive attachment. Okay, so the receiver tries to report this um, abusive attachment to Facebook. However, um, you'll notice here that since the same GCM ciphertext C star is sent both times, that due to this deduplication behavior, um, Facebook, um, I'm just going to assume that the second ciphertext sent is a duplicate. 
and they're not going to log anything about it in the abuse report. So the kind of upshot of this is that the abusive attachment will never make it into the abuse report, and so all attempts by the user to report this to Facebook are going to fail. Now, it might seem kind of strange that we're able to construct this special GCM ciphertext in the first place, because isn't GCM a secure authenticated encryption scheme? And of course it is, but it's worth noting that we are not in the standard AEAD setting here. In particular, the attacker is able to choose both of the keys that he uses in the attack himself. So what this all boils down to is that the attack exploits the fact that GCM is not robust. And interestingly, as far as we know, this is the first real-world attack that exploits the fact that an encryption scheme doesn't have this property of robustness. Okay, so as a proof of concept, we showed that you can um, use Facebook secret conversations to send this abusive image on the left. However, when the receiver tries to report this to Facebook, all Facebook are going to see in the abuse report is this picture of a cute kitten. And these are the actual images that we use in the proof of concept. Now, Facebook Messenger source code refers to encrypted messages as salamanders. And because in our attacks, these encrypted messages seem to disappear, you can think of this as an invisible salamander, which is where the title of our talk came from. And um, this little fellow here um, is an axolotl, which is an endangered and really cute um, kind of salamander, which is why we chose to use him in the proof of concept. So Facebook remediated the vulnerability and awarded a bug bounty, and um, many thanks to John Milliken for answering lots of questions and helping us understand how everything works. Now, needless to say, um, there's a lot more detail that goes into the attack than I've had time to talk about here. So if anyone's interested, the full details are given in the paper. OK, so we've seen what message franking is. And we've also seen how existing solutions for message franking are quite slow. And how Facebook's work around to this is what enabled this invisible salamander attack. So in the final section of the talk, I'm going to give an overview for our solution for fast and secure message franking. So I guess the kind of key question here is, can we build a secure message franking scheme which matches the efficiency of the fastest AAD schemes such as GCM and OCB? Now, in particular, these schemes are single pass, and they only have to make one block cipher call per block of input data processed. Now, interestingly, it turns out that both the answer to this question and the idea behind our construction lies in collision-resistant hashing. The kind of observation that um, enables this is that um, whatever function our franking scheme is going to use to compute this binding tag commitment, it's got to be collision-resistant in the sense that it should be infeasible to find two messages M and M prime, which both produce the same binding tag. Hopefully, intuitively, you can kind of see that were it easy to find these kind of collisions, we're going to lose this nice binding property that allows us to prove to a service provider that some message corresponds to that binding tag. So the cool thing about this is that it allows us to um, tap into the whole wealth of literature on collision-resistant hashing. So firstly, the bad news is that known impossibility results about collision-resistant hash functions rule out a wide class of efficient block cipher-based message franking schemes, which match the efficiency of OCB and GCM in terms of block cipher calls per message block. So essentially, what these results show is that to achieve collision resistance, you've got to do a certain amount of work per block processed, and that amount of work is greater than what is performed by these schemes. However, the good news is that we can um, use the classic merkle damgard hash function and adapt this to build the very first single-pass secure message franking scheme. So our scheme is called hash function chain chaining, and we're going to try and give like, a flavor of our approach now. OK, so the merkle damgard construction allows us to build a collision-resistant hash function from a collision-resistant compression function and a suitable padding scheme. So how this works is basically you pad up your message data, chop it into blocks, and then iteratively hash it using a compression function. And it's well known that this gives a collision-resistant hash function, provided that the underlying compression is collision-resistant and a suitable padding scheme is used. So we're going to use this as the basis for our message franking scheme. So the first adaptation we make 
is we construct a sort of keyed version of Merkle Damgard by XORing a secret key into each block of message data that we process. And hopefully you can kind of see intuitively why we're going to need some kind of keyed function to have a secure franking scheme. We also um, add an additional keyed compression function call at the start of this process for technical reasons that I'm not really going to go into here, but basically we need it for the proof. So now it's this function that we're going to use to compute the binding tag for our cipher tech, for our franking scheme, C2. Now, the clever trick which allows us to perform the full message franking encryption with just a single pass over the data is that rather than just discarding the intermediate chaining variables we pass through while computing this function, we're instead going to use these as random pads to encrypt the message blocks. And so the upshot of this is that we get to um, compute both the binding tag and the ciphertext with just a single pass over the message data. And in fact, for certain parameter settings, um, this incurs no overhead over just computing um, that binding tag hash function. So in the paper, we prove that this construction is essentially a sort of one-time secure variant of message franking under the assumption that the um, underlying compression function is collision resistant and satisfies a weak form of RKA PRS security. So this gives us kind of one-time secure message ranking, and then we show in the paper um, examples of simple and efficient transforms that allow us to lift this one-time secure scheme into fully fledged, fledged multi-use secure message ranking. And for those who are interested, full details and proofs are in the paper. So just to wrap up, we've talked about what message ranking is. We've seen um, how Facebook's approach to message ranking and met the invisible salamanders. And finally, I've talked about our solution for fast message ranking. So um, this work was presented at Crypto 2018. Um, there is a paper on ePrint and a full version with all the proofs and details should be coming any day now. And um, that's all from me. So thank you very much. Great, thanks, Joanne. So we have time for questions. So if they had used OCB instead of GCM, would this would the attack still work? Um, oh gosh, um, yes, it would. So OCB is not a secure message franking scheme either. Um, no scheme that um, so OCB and GCM are both rate one, and neither of these have this kind of collision with this property yeah. that we need. So yes, um, it would be possible with OCB also. Okay. Uh, great. Yeah. Question, please. Thanks for the talk. Um, th this might be outside the scope of this work, but I'm just wondering, in the context of secure messaging, sometimes uh, abusive conversations can occur uh, more contextually. So there could be, for example, no smoking gun. There couldn't be a single message that I could identify. Or it could be the opposite. I could identify a message that in context makes a lot of sense. So maybe for future work, how can we look at whether we report entire conversations as abusive or contextualize messages within conversations without having to send the entire conversation to, to Facebook for decryption or verification? Oh, that's a good question. It was kind of outside the scope of this work. So I guess um, I, there has been some follow-up up work done by other authors um, that kind of look at more fine-grained approaches to abuse reporting, because maybe you wouldn't want to reveal the whole conversation. You just want to reveal certain parts. Um, so. Yeah, I think, so also Facebook do check multiple, um, they would check multiple attachments and stuff, so you would be able to see context coming over messages. But I think, yeah, there's definitely interesting work to be done and more kind of fine-grained approaches to this. Thanks very much. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Is this on? Um, uh, your solution with this uh, Merkle Domgard simultaneously outputting pads to XOR with the message looks a lot like a sponge, uh, duplexing sponge construction. Um, wh what, uh, can you tell us what the, the difference is between this and a duplexing sponge? Okay, no, it's a really good point. So, um, that, yeah, there definitely are natural similarities. In the paper, we also um, kind of show how to um, build a sponge-based version of this message franking scheme um, using the duplexing construction. I think the kind of... The kind of key reason we were interested in doing it, just using a compression function, is we wanted it to be really simple to implement um, and to be really fast. So at the moment, that seemed like the best approach to do it. But um, yeah, we do give it another sponge-based construction, and that would definitely be something interesting to explore as well. Thank you. Is there an efficiency difference between the two? Um, so, oh gosh, so this isn't really my strong suit, but um, I, think, I think we just felt that like, the, we were just using really simple primitives that were very easy to implement and stuff, and so, yeah, whereas sponge things maybe aren't quite there yet. So. Cool. Yeah. 
in certain end-to-end -end encrypted protocols like uh, MP, OTR, or OTR, uh, there is the property of deniability that is desired, and it seems to be in contrast with your uh, desired property here. Uh, what do you have to say about that? Can they be combined, or are they mutually exclusive? Oh gosh, that's a really interesting question. Um, which I haven't, I, it seems to me like, yeah, there seems to be like, they are, they are mutually exclusive, like almost like at odds with each other. Um, like the whole, yeah, we really want this to make everything verifiable, so that's gonna be at odds with um, the kind of deniability. Um, so yeah, I, I, whether, I don't, yeah, I would say that they are at odds with each other, but I haven't constructed any formal proof of looked into this more formally yet. Thank you. Yeah, it sounds like sending, deniably sending abusive messages would be kind of a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yes. <laughs> awesome. All right, thank you very much, John. Thank this, you. this is really cool. Yeah, really cool work. All right, so our last talk of the session is about security for Snapchat messages, and it's going to be given by Subhash. Uh, why is it offline? <laughs> Great. Sorry. I don't know why I disconnected from the Wi-Fi. Oh, it doesn't. Oh, crap. It worked there. <laughs> Thank you. All lowercase. <laughs> All right, great. Let's see if this is better. Okay, Google. Great. Sorry for the snafu. So, uh, Presentation gods are not with me. <sighs> All right, great. <laughs> Finally, we got this. So, uh, just I'm here uh, to talk about how we uh, enable end-to-end -end -end protection for our users, primarily as a means of increasing the security and privacy assurances for them. So, obviously, as one can imagine. Uh, end-to-end -end encryption is probably 0 0.0001 cryptography and everything is a sort of like building systems and scale. So this is the team that actually built it. So what's a snap, right? Like I'm sure, uh, I don't know how many of you are Snapchat users, so I'm gonna basically give a little context about it. So it's most conversations, if you look at it, are uh, people think of them as, as text. But snaps are mostly, it's all about multimedia messages or as the previous presenter said, they're like attachments for us. That is the primary means of communication with which our users communicate is snaps, which is a, I'll show about it. So a little bit of the company, it's about sort of like we get about to talk about the scale. We have 186 million users that use the app on a daily basis and a few billion snaps are exchanged on a daily basis that we are trying to protect. 
So this is sort of how the flow looks like. So you take a picture of the Snapchat app, you apply whatever cool stickers or fun stuff you want, you click the blue button on the bottom, send, and then when you, you pick a recipient from the list. So one of the caveats, if you look at the screen, is very different from other end-to-end -end, uh, protection protocols is you're not typing in a text where you have the opportunity to go fetch a key from somewhere. It's, the user has created the content and then they click a button, they back on the app. So there's very little time to actually do key exchange dances, so we'll talk more about that. So snaps inherently have privacy protections. They're ephemeral, so the moment you view them, they're gone. Um, they're, if you haven't opened it in 30 days, they're deleted. And if you try to replay a snap, we get a notification that the recipient has replayed the snap. Same with screenshots. And part of it actually, the way we have these protections built in is actually contributing to a significant churn in identity. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Essentially a privacy defense costing us a little bit more on end-to-end -end encryption. So why end-to-end -end encryption? It's a pretty much solved problem as we've talked about it. There's like fantastic research where they're talking about micro-optimizing on the optimizations and here we are sort of like probably even less than 101. So why am I here? So why did we want to do it? So one, it's a defense in depth mechanism. So we wanted it on by default and also sort of like increased assurances around privacy to our users. And well, it's essentially a solved problem. So I'll just, I'll go through this quickly. It's already been talked about. So uh, Alice wants to send a message to Bob to seal the message with a key that can only be decrypted by Bob's device. One of the things that we have to deal with, we had to deal with as a first class citizen was the fact that, fact that what if Bob changes the devices, right? Like, so the message actually goes to Bob's device, but Bob can't decrypt it. So it's essentially that you have to retry the, the message or to, to decrypt it. Now, what if Alice changes devices? So now you essentially have message loss. So if you think of like some of the key requirements from this, if you look at this, right? Like if, as things happen, like for example, if the retry, the amount of time it takes to retry increases, the probability that the sender has changed devices also increases, which essentially translates to message losses. So what are some of the key requirements that we thought were going in, right? Like as very fast key distribution, a very fast mechanism to retry messages, because essentially any retry delay increases the probability that the sender is actually changing the device and there will be content loss. So status quo, I think as I said before, it's been implemented. But what are some of the key differentiators from them with our app, right? Like, none of them actually have a, a logout button. iMessage has one, but what is the, when was the last time that anyone actually logged out of their iMessage unless they're actually changing devices or something, or getting a new phone? Uh, next is we actually couple our app with like single session restrictions because we have this notion of let's try to enforce one timeness of uh, you can only play a certain piece of content once. Imagine you have multiple sessions and how are you going to enforce this across multiple devices that are varying degrees of connectivity. It's just a massively distributed DRM problem which is very hard to solve. The simplistic way out was like let's keep it a single session so we can enforce one timeness. Their authentication model, if you really look at it, relies on device identity. For example, WhatsApp, Signal, or iMessage, right? Like the authentication is tied specifically to the device. So it's very hard for anyone to churn them. And sessions are extremely tightly coupled to a particular device. So we introduce this notion of an account-based end-to-end encryption. So private keys are still exclusively present on a client device, but we needed a mechanism by which we could very quickly change the private key to device association and propagate that change very quickly to the social graph and also make retry much faster. I'll talk about that. And adding notions of recipient level forward secrecy as, uh, as is introduced by Axel Tal makes retry slower. I'll talk about that a little bit later. And also our users, we have this concept of a streak. Like for example, every day users actually s exchange snaps with each other and every day they exchange it. Uh, the streak count goes up. There are certain users that actually have streak counts in multiple years. So now if you go in and say, oh, uh, sorry, this, you change your device, you're gonna lose a streak, that's gonna be a very upsetting conversation with our users. So that's not something we could, the business would allow us to do. So we had to relax some of those constraints. So what are some of the building blocks we had? Right? Like obviously first it starts with identity. So we needed a database that was secure in a post lockout mechanism. So secrets are, can be stored in it only when the user the, to which those secrets belong to are actually logged in. 
So the help of the server, essentially it's sort of like a two by two secret shared system. So we created an encrypted database on the client and the keys can only be decrypted when the user logs in. The symmetric key with which the database is encrypted is delivered back to the client in a, when the user logs in. And we did not want any information leakage about the identity of the other user on, in a post logout state. For example, no user IDs can be present or public keys or any of those because we didn't want, hey, can I use your, uh, if the user is logging in on an untrusted device, we wanted to have zero information leakage. Even public keys, user IDs, they're all, they're all uh, can be tied back to users. So simple cryptographic techniques, but sort of which made our implementation much harder, but we wanted to add this defense. Keyed HPACs that are keyed with sort of like the user specific key, uh, instead of like thinking using native IDs or hashes. So how does login work in the system, right? Like so client logs in from a new device, to generate a key pair, there's a database encryption key. And it all obviously can have a list of other public keys that are present on it. So it sends an HMACT list of public keys, if any present. Um, sends obviously the current public key along with the current login credentials, right? Like, so that's as part of login itself. We, again, if you look at it, we wanted to make retry as fast as possible. So the identity is generated as part of login and it goes to the server. The server checks if there is a, a retrievable identity with the credentials as passed and the HMAC list of public keys it has sent. So it said, okay, so this is a user that is logging in from the same device, so I can actually retrieve the identity. If yes, then it sends back the database encryption key. If no, then it basically associates a, this new public key to this particular user and instantaneously does a fan out of this public key to the entire social graph. So this is sort of like this notion of account-based identity which makes a, a super fast fan out. So obviously now the server response comes back. If there's a database encryption key, the client will be like, oh, sure, I can actually retrieve the identity. It decrypts it and then it can open the database and uh, everything's good. If it cannot, then it says, okay, so this is, uh, this is a, the server couldn't retrieve the identity. This is an identity I need to use. So it commits the previous uh, leap generated key pair, sort of like almost like a two-phase commit it, it, uh, across the client and the server. And then it starts, the client, the, the server is the one that's saying, yes, this is the commit message. So it can start using it and persist it and say, this is my new identity and uses it. So sort of like if we go back to the requirements check, so securely support multiple users on a given device, this, this building block gives us that. And it also makes retries super fast because you can very quickly fan out the public key. So next is sort of like the, how does content get uploaded? Because it's not, none of us is sort of text messages. So anytime a piece of content or an image or a snap is created, we encrypt it with a content encryption key that's generated on the client to make things faster because these are large video files. So we actually start uploading the content right away, um, but we never send the CEK up. So it's just the content gets uploaded. And when the user chooses to share the content with Snapchat, then the content encryption key is uploaded. The additional property you sort of get with this is that if a user chooses to discard the content, then we actually, our servers cannot even decrypt it. So sorry, we just don't, we have a bunch of garbage bytes that just get deleted away by the garbage collector at a, after a certain period of time. And the interesting thing, it's not as uh, this notion of franking, but it's say uh, the abuse wise, one of the things that helps is the fact that there's a CEK. What we do is sort of just, if a recipient uploads, uh, claims abuse, we just have to, the recipient has to upload the CEK instead of the content. It doesn't have all the great properties that, it, that we talked about, but at the very least, there is assurance that it was indeed the image that was uh, sent by the sender. So what are the, some of the changes for end-to-end -end encryption? Obviously very trivial, just take that CEK and wrap it in a manner that's end-to-end -end encrypted. So you, pers you have to persist the CEK in the client because you need, uh, the, you need to be ready for a retry message. If you don't persist it on the client, it, you discard it, then a retry is not possible. So we actually need to persist it in, a, in the same post logout secure database until you receive an ACK or we have content expiry. We actually have 30 day content expiries. We have a cleaner that cleans out everything in 30 days on the client. The crypto is pretty much the easy part. Uh, just use a KDF to a secret from the pre-shared secret and encrypt and mark it with any uh, additional authentication data, the CEK. Sort of like how does the picture look like? So Alice is on uh, device D1 with a public identity AD1. Bob is on these three, three devices. There's a public key synchronization protocol. Alice creates a snap, encrypts it, uploads, encrypted, encrypts it, uploads it, 
to Snapchat servers with the key K1, but K1 is not sent. Now you take the K1 and wrap it to Bob's three devices, and Bob can fetch the, encrypt, uh, fetch the encrypted snap, unwrap K1 because he's on a device that, has, that can unwrap it and decrypt the snap. It's pretty straightforward. This works fine for 99.9% .9 of the time, but the 0.1% is something we had to engineer a whole lot for. So obviously what it does, it supports multiple devices for a given user. This is the key requirement that it meets. So the other building blocks that we had to build, it's sort of like this fun notion of catch me if you can on the sender side. So if you look at this picture, again, same thing as before, Alice has uploaded something, uh, a piece of content that's encrypted. Uh, what if key, the key Bob has on a new device after the key sync phase is completed? So now what do you do? So essentially you can let it go through and sort of initiate a retry. Or you basically say, no, the server can say, the Bob is actually on a, on a different device that he cannot decrypt it. So I'm gonna catch the, the, synchronously catch that. Send a message back to Alice's client saying that, hey, Bob is on a new device, you gotta rewrap this message. And uh, Alice's client sends it back. Obviously, security-wise, Snapchat is, in, in, is trusted to do this. And uh, one of the additional protections we wanted to add was the fact that the, our client can only talk to our servers and we actually have certificate pinning in our app. So unless you're actually able to convince DigiSir to issue a new cert for app.snapchat.com, it's very hard to intercept that communication channel. So that's the additional security benefit we have with, uh, with certificate pinning. So now Bob can actually uh, unwrap, the, unwrap, fetch the encrypted snap, unwrap, unwrap K1 because he's encrypted to Bob's device D4. From a requirement standpoint, obviously in this case, make retries faster because we didn't even actually have to, even have to encrypt it. Uh, sorry, and retry it sort of like a quick half retry loop. So what are the other building blocks, right? Like so it's on the recipient side. Like imagine Alice has sent a snap, everything's Alice has received an act that from Snapchat servers that the message has been received. Now Bob's logging in from a new device. Now obviously Bob can decrypt it, so there's no point in Snapchat server sending that message to Bob's client. So we suppress it there, and then we kick off a, a retry process. So how does this retry work? So if you look at it, this is sort of where we are. Bob logs in, he's got pending snaps from Alice, Carol, and Dave. So what do we do at this point? So we basically send retry requests that contains Bob new key um, to Alt, uh, uh, to Alice, Carol, and Carol, Dave's mobile clients, and say, we ac actually have a content that needs to be rewrapped, please rewrap it this, with this particular, with this new key. So, and then the snaps are delivered back to Bob in a manner that is asynchronous. So what are the retry mechanisms we could use, right? Like one, it's obviously a regular message that is, that uh, each of Alice, Carol, and Dave can retrieve it whenever they open the app next time, or actually a push notification to make it more instantaneous because you wanna be, you want retries to be as fast as possible, right? Like, now, with push notifications, there's an interesting security problem because push notifications are not completely in our control. They're, we first send a message to, Apple's, to Amazon's SNS servers. From there, it goes to Apple or Google for ultimate delivery to the user. So the push notification actually contains the public key to rewrap to. So the integrity of this message is paramount because if someone can tamper with it, then they can basically say, hey, rewrap this message to this, to this new public key, that, and we have zero control over that. So, what we did is sort of like a, a very simple thing. We encrypted the public key with a key that is only known to the logged in user in Snapchat servers, sort of like this Google introduced this notion of end-to-end -end, uh, security of push notifications between the sender and the devices. So they published a blog post, sorry, I forgot to put a link to it, but we kind of did the similar thing on a year earlier um, across both Android and iOS. So from a requirements standpoint, status check, so obviously retries are super fast with this. Where are we? Obviously we launched it 362 62 days back. So sort of, we were trying to time it to Real World Crypto 2018 last year, but we ran into a bug which took us three months to fix. <laughs> so we couldn't launch it in time for that, so here we are. Uh, the retry rate is super low, like 0.1%, so that was something we could launch with. And the more interesting part is with us, thanks to all of these things, right? Like 50% of those things that need to be retried, under three and a half seconds, we're actually able to finish the retry. 
And within a minute, right, like 80% of all content that has been surprised has, uh, suppressed has actually been retried, and the users are actually able to receive the content. So from a product and a UX standpoint, it's completely seamless. We could turn it on by default because we have these, uh, the users just don't even notice that this is ha happening under the hoods. So obviously, there is some of these, some, we can do a, a, some extensions to this. So we can have periodic forward secrecy. And these are all future. We're trying to implement. There's no commitments. So you can do periodic forward secrecy, because you can say that, say, each user rotates their key in a month or something. So the window of compromise is sort of reduced. And uh, you can use sort of like this notion of sender to send other sender. So basically, you can reduce the message loss. Obviously, extend it to other message types, like text and group chat, and then travel parent spectrum of ETA versus ATE. We so far only have E. So we obviously have to add A uh, via peer authenticity or some protocol like Conix. And summary, I'm just going to skip over it in the interest of leaving time for questions. Thank you very much. So are there any uh, kind of um, interesting open problems that you would like to uh, present to the community here, like things you'd like to do that you can't do already? Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat? Like, uh, you describe a complete system. Is there yes. more work to be done here? Is like, uh, yes. So obviously what we want to do is we do, uh, as, as I talked about in this, uh, like periodic forward secrecy. So ah, you want to be able to do like ratcheting in a periodic basis. Uh, like we have other oh, yes. message types. Got so it. those are all things that we're planning on working. Any other questions? Yeah, please. Thanks for the talk. That was interesting. Thank you. Um, I see you do fan out to all the devices. Have you run into performance limitations there? If you had? No. I think but the advantage is the fact that because you have one key that is being massively fanned out, there are advantages. We can use some different kinds of fan out architectures to actually help with that. On the other hand, for example, if you have like the WhatsApp style of encryption where you have these bag of keys, each of those bag needs to go to. So you have multiple messages being published and multiple things that subscribers. So it, at the very least, you have one single publish a message that is being published and then the fan out. So that made it easier for us. Thanks. Let's go to the far end. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is this on? Oh, yeah, OK. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. That was really cool. Um, I was just wondering, when you, when you um, encrypt uh, the K1 to Bob's different devices, uh, is there any kind of a consistency check between those different encryptions? Um, what, what I'm thinking is that um, Alice could uh, encrypt different keys uh, to cause Bob to decrypt uh, a snap to different images on different devices. Um, so so does, does, does Bob actually check that the, 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 key that it, the, the key that he's using to decrypt the message is the same one that it was kind of committed to during, during encryption? Or? Oh, yes. So basically, because what will happen is like when they, it's, there is sort of like this ca notion of catching everywhere. So Bob's device looks at it, looks at the snap, and before the even a push notification gets shown to the user, we actually check, is this, a, is this message actually, can it be decrypted by this particular Bob's device? So we do have that additional check. Does that answer your question, or am I answering a different question? Um, I, I think that's a different question, but we can, we can take it offline. I think he's asking about consistency. Can you make sure that all Bob's right, devices, so, so all the devices get the same message? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's just because it's, the message is one the same. This is not, it does, so it's just but, a message, it, and it's got a, a envelope of key wrapping around top of it. But, uh, well, but maybe this isn't a real threat in practice, but if Alice intentionally d encrypted different keys, then Bob could decrypt, on different devices, could decrypt that snap differently. But the snap, the, the content is one. So if you look at it, the content has already been generated, and it's already been uploaded once. So even if you use different keys, then it, it won't decrypt because the content was already a priori uploaded. There's only one piece of content, and you're just wrapping that content encryption key with different public keys, effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the last talk, we saw how you can Yeah, create... I think there's a deeper question here. So yeah, okay. maybe we should take that offline. Okay. That's, it's, a good, it's, a good, it's a good topic. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was very interesting and uh, enlightening. Um, the terms of service for Snapchat says that you can respond to warrants. How do you do that with this protocol? So uh, as I'll t I can talk about what we do today. So we basically uh, respond to a warrant with what we have in our systems. And what we have in our systems is bytes we can decrypt. <laughs> wow. Good answer. Yeah. Um, 
Thanks for the talk and thanks for doing this. Just to maybe follow up on that, but to understand your last point about the E but no A, does that mean that in your currently deployed system, if you told Alice to rewrap something saying, hey, Bob has this new device, that Alice will basically believe you and do it? Absolutely. And Alice doesn't currently have a way to check whether that device in fact belongs to Bob. Absolutely. We have that weakness in our system today. But the A would be you might have a way to change that in a future. Yes, that's the point we want to add. And Conix is one approach we want to take uh, are the more simpler just pure authenticity verification. But the interesting thing for us is because the device churn is so high, like it just how do you surface that? So that's where we... There's a few challenges. We're not sure how to solve that problem yet because you just don't want to bombard the users. It's sort of like a device change, device change, and then everyone is just going to ignore those messages. So Thanks. Hi. This is kind of a follow-up to his question. Um, if you add the authentication layer, will you change your threat model to allow client other than the ones you trust? Uh, basically, the is it... My hunch is we're always going to be sort of in this model of E then A and not A then E. So it's, we're, the use, we can't surface to the user that there is a, a potential device change. But it, again, these are very future looking. The way we implement it, if I were to implement it, and if what I can get our uh, product guys to sign off on is an E then A model and not the inverse. You're not going to stop messages from being sent just because, oh, uh, this user has changed their device identity. Now go to that and verify them. So. Okay. Um, my, I was asking because you said that your threat model implies that you're using Snapchat servers and Chap, uh, Snapchat's client software, not a third-party developed implementation. That is correct. Uh, would that ever change if you managed to make something like key transparency implemented to where um, any kind of cryptographic abuse, uh, sending authorized keys was not um, really practical? So if you think of like protocols like Conics, right? Like if we, we prototyped it, we had an intern look at it. What, what we would do is sort of like the root key, right? Like the, the root will be transmitted to say someone like the conics.princeton.edu or some other entity like the EFF. The client would make two calls to this and the other server. So that way you can say that there is a, a root that is more trusted. Uh, and that's, but the client software in itself, I don't think if you're asking, are we planning on open sourcing that or putting the crypto components of it up for review? It's a conversation we can have, but I, as far as, and we have done a independent security review of it, but not, we're not, I don't think we've open sourced that. I don't know, I don't know where you're, what your question is. Okay, well, thank you. Okay. We take one more question. Um, okay, so uh, very quick questions. So very fascinating stuff. Maybe uh, not everything could uh, one could get from slides. Is a, a white paper at least, and hopefully ideally something with like formulas, like in the, you know like you know requirements that members of crypto community can kind of read, critique, improve, uh, uh, because it's very hard when it's just kind of among slides. Anything formal we can study from? Yeah, this? We, we will. We're working on it. We're hoping to release it uh, in about 30 to 45 days. That's sort of where we are at. The first draft is done. It just takes time. We want to be absolutely certain that we are like every dot is, every I is dotted correctly. Yes, it's in the works. Okay. Cool. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so we have a break now until 11, and we'll start at 11 with more crypto and politics.